I was listening to a conversation between a couple of men a while back and hearing them talk it just sparked some things in my mind and was giving me some ideas and then uh, started to write those things down and, and so when pastor asked us to be ready for the day I already had, already had an idea of where to go but then I heard another man preach and I heard some other things that he had to say and so of course I wrote those down and I took his notes and so I'm going to be honest with you not everything I have to say is originally mine tonight but the Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun. So I'm taking some things from one man and some things from another man and some things that God gave me and putting them all together. And hopefully, not hopefully, I know that it's going to bless somebody today because it came from him. So if you have your Bibles or not, I'm still going to read a text this morning. It's going to be one that probably everybody in here has heard at least once. Not many times. We're going to go to the book of John, chapter number 3. I'm going to read verse 16 and 17. John 3, 16 and 17. Most of us can probably quote it. If you want to do that, that's fine. But John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So for the next little while, I'd, talk, I'd like to talk about God's love. Talk about God's love. Amen. One more time, let's just raise our hands and ask God to minister to us today. Help us, Lord, to hear what it is that you have to say to us. I pray, God, that you would remove me and that you would just speak through me, God, and you would minister to your people the way you want to this morning, Lord. You know and you knew ahead of time who was going to be here in this service today. You knew who this word was for and I pray, God, that you would do your work, that you would minister, that you would bless today. We pray in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated today. In living for God and, and walking with God and, and doing the things of God, we experience Peace, we experience hope, we experience joy, and we experience love. And when we look, we look at the, the fruits of the Spirit and we begin to see those things, we realize that those are all traits that come from God. Those are all things that are given to us by God. Those are the good things of God that we have in our lives, the benefits of that we have of living for Him. But we know on the flip side of that coin that the enemy tries every day to take those things away. He tries to remove them and replace them and replace them with sadness, replace them with loneliness, replace them with fear and with hatred, the things that are opposite of the blessings of God. He would re like to remove them and he would like to give you the complete opposite. And the enemy would do his best to keep you from knowing God and to keep you from knowing who God is. And it was this same spirit, the things that would be uh, opposite of, of the gifts of God. It's the same spirit that Jesus is addressing in Luke chapter 11. He's talking to the Pharisees here, Luke eleven forty two. 42. He says, But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. He says, You pass over judgment and you pass over the love of God. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. And the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. These were the individuals that the people looked to for counsel. They knew the law. They, they supposedly they knew the things of God. And they were the ones that should have known the right way to lead the people. They should have known the things to teach and to preach. But Matthew 23, 23, the same account says this, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Saying you're paying tithes and, and you're going through the motions of the things you're supposed to do, but you're leaving out the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. They left out the things that should have been taught and they should have preached. They left out, and Luke tells us, the love 
of God. And you and I today, we cannot afford to leave out the love of God in our church. We cannot afford to preach the things and and the laws and to preach the edicts and not talk about the love of God. We cannot preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified and disregard God's love. Because the spirit and this attitude that it's all about legalism and it's all about you have to do it this way and you have to do it that way. It goes completely against who God is. And 1 John 4 and 7 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. We know that if you don't know, if you don't love, you don't know God, because God is love. And Jesus, he was talking to the Pharisees, and we read, and he told them, hey, you guys need to figure this out. And then he turned around, John 17, he prays for his disciples because he did not want them to have the same spirit that the Pharisees had. In John 17, 25, he says this, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. Verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. He's praying, let the love that you show me be in them. And his prayer that that same love would be in them. And this way, the reason why is so that the world would see God in them through that love. Church, if you want the world to see God in you, you have to be a reflection of the love of God. If you want to make a difference in your world, they're going to have to feel the love of God emanating from you. If you want to make a difference in the city of Dinuba, they are going to have to feel the love of God in you. When you go to minister and to witness to somebody, to tell them about Jesus, in order for them to take you serious and to hear what you have to say, they have to feel the love of God. If people are going to come into this service and going to come into this church and if people are going to come in and be changed, they're going to have to feel the love of God here in the church. When they walk through the doors, they're going to have to feel the welcome. They're going to have to feel the embrace of the love. They're going to have to feel the the gladness that we have, the joy that they're here, the sincerity of those people that come in. They're going to have to feel welcome in order for them to truly feel the presence of God. Amen. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Just like Jesus loves you and I, we also have to love each other. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. All day until you're blue in the face, you can say that you're a follower of God. You can say you're a Christian. But do you display the love? Amen. You're going to have to love God in order to make it to heaven. That's first because, you you know, how are you going to get up to heaven and say, Lord, I'm here. But that's an obvious statement. In order to make it to heaven, you have to love God. But you're also going to have to love people to make it to heaven. And think about this, the majority of the issues that you and I face in life, the majority of the trials that we have, the problems that we face, those are going to come from people. It's people that are the problem. And most of, like I said, those trials and tribulations are going to come from people, but you still have to love the people. And one of the men I was listening to, he said this, and I've never thought about it this way. And he said, the way that I can love people that hurt me, And the way that I can love people that do me wrong. And the way that I can love people that talk about me behind my back. Is that when I see them, I see the image of God. Because the scripture says that you and I are made in his image. And when we, if we can get to a point that when we see people, we can see the image of God. Becomes a whole lot easier to let those things go. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to fight with God. And I don't want to have problems with God. And I don't want to talk bad about God. And it becomes a whole lot easier to love somebody when they look like God to you. Amen. When we begin to see the good things in people, we begin to see the image of God, it's a whole lot easier to love 
everybody. And John 14, 21 says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Amen. I want to love God. And if you want to love God, you've got to get a hold of his commandments and to keep them. And that was a problem with the Pharisees. As they had the, the commandments of God and the laws of God, but they ignored the love. And there are some people in this world that are all about the love of God, and they just hold on to the love, and they disregard the commandments. But the scripture tells us here, if you get a hold of his commandments and keep his commandments, that's when the love of God is going to be manifest. He's going to manifest himself to you. If you want to find out what God is commanding you, find out what God is asking of you, get into his word. Listen to the preaching of the word. Get into the reading of the word. Begin to study. Do these things. And the scripture says he will manifest himself to you. And all of a sudden you're going to love to come to church. You're going to love the ministry of the word. Love being around brothers and sisters. Love the fellowship. All of those things was when the love of God becomes evident in you. Amen. And in our text, John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. And John 1 and 1 tells us that in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And we skip down, it says the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So when you put John 1 together with John 3, we read here that God himself loved you and I so much that he took on the form of man, wrapped himself in flesh. He lived for 33 and a half years. He suffered. He died and he rose again so that we could have the hope of salvation. And there are people in here today who say, I love God, but I've been too bad for him to love me back. I've done too many bad things. Or you may say this, I'm simply not good enough for God to love me. Or I don't deserve the love of God. And you know what? You are absolutely correct. You're right. Because not one of us deserve the love of God. And not one of us is good enough to have the love of God. Because I cannot earn the love of God. And I don't deserve the love of God. But he gives it to me anyways. He said, this love is for you and it's free. And when you feel worthless, remember that God already paid it all. And there's nothing you have to pay. Because you don't have to be worthy. Amen. And I know this, some of us say, you know, I keep messing up, and I can't get it right, and I'm a failure, and no matter how hard I try, I just, I fail again and again. But I want to read 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as, such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. This is such a powerful scripture. Sometimes things like this are even more powerful when we read them in a different translation. And I want to read it in the easy to read translation, which I call the NLT. It says this, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Whatever it is that you're tempted with, whatever it is the devil brings against you and tries to pull you away from, You are not the first person that's been tempted with that. And you will not be the last person to be tempted with that. It says whatever it is, it's common to man. There's nothing you're tempted by that a whole bunch of other people haven't already gone through. And we all face different temptations. I thought about this example that if I was sitting at home and a man walked into the living room with a wheelbarrow full of cocaine, it wouldn't do anything to me. I've never experienced it. I wouldn't know how to sell it. I wouldn't know what to do with it. I'd get that out of here. That's junk. That's trash. But there are people in here that that would be a temptation to you. But there are other things that if they walk through the front door, I say, whoa, I would have a problem with that. Different temptations. We all face different things. But it's not unique to you because there's nothing new under the sun like we mentioned earlier. And it says it's no different from what others experience. And no matter what the temptation is, the scripture says here is that God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more 
than you can stand. He's not going to bring something in front of you that's more than you can take. And the scripture never says that we won't be tempted. But it says when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. As a matter of fact, he can't make a way of escape until we've been tempted. If alcohol is a temptation, he's not going to remove every liquor store off of each corner. He said, oh, my brother can't handle beer, so I'm going to go remove all the beer in the, in, the, in the city that I knew. But that's not how he works. That's not how he operates. But he's going to make a way out, to provide a way out. But in order for that to happen, you have to be honest with God. God already knows your mind and your weakness and what you deal with. But you can't just say, oh, you know, this time I, I'll figure it out. I can deal with it. But you got to get honest with God. When you're tempted, be real with him. Tell him, Lord, you know my struggle. You know my weakness. And, Lord, I can't do it, and I can't make it without your help. And when you will get honest with God and you will get sincere with God and tell him, Lord, I've got to have your help in this situation. I've got to have your help with this problem. You know I'm struggling and so on. And if you will do that, you will watch him fulfill his word and make a way of escape. you find that, that, that Lord, I, I've got to depend on you. And, Lord, if you'll put it into his hands, he will make a way of escape when there seems to be no way. And you'll find that it's hard to sin when you're praying. It's hard to mess up when you're talking to God. Amen. When the temptation comes, if you begin to pray, begin to ask God for help, the scripture tells us he will make a way of escape. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse number 5 says this, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Before you were ever conceived, before you were ever born, God already knew your name. Before you ever entered into this life, God already knew who you were going to be. Before you ever faced problems as a kid, before you ever came across the trials and the things that you've gone through in life, Jesus already had you. In mind, before you ever walk through those doors today, God knew that you were going to be here in this service this morning. Before you ever came in with a, with a tear in your eye and heaviness in your heart, God already knew the answer that you needed here today. But he also knew he, you would need a reminder of how much he loves you. A reminder this morning of the love of God. A reminder this morning that he loves you no matter how far you feel like you've drifted. No matter how bad you feel like you are. No matter how worthless you feel. That God wants to remind you today of his love. Amen. Sometimes we think of God just being... Uh, an all-knowing being up in the heavens who is waiting to drop a hammer on us whenever we make a mistake. We think to walking through life on, on tiptoes and thinking as soon as we mess up, God is just going to punish us right then and right there. And we think that it's, it's, I can't mess up because if I do, he's going to tell the pastor. And the pastor's going to know and he's going to get up here and he's going to tell the whole church what I've been doing wrong. And I've never seen Pastor Bodie do that and I don't think he will do that. But sometimes it's in our mind that, you know, God, as soon as I mess up, God's going to, he's just going to let me have it. And let's look at a story in the scripture talking about this. It's another, another really uh, famous story of, uh, that we all know, but I want to talk about something that we might not have considered before. John chapter 4, verse number 5. It says, Then cometh he, talking about Jesus, to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? which I'm a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritan. It says that Jesus was there. He was sitting by the well. And the Samaritan woman walks up, and he asks her for a drink of water. And she basically, why are you talking to me? I'm not good enough for you to talk to me. We know that, that the Jews treated the Samaritans as animals, as dogs. They didn't have nothing to do with them. And already she knew that Jesus was a Jew, and so in her mind she was inferior. 
in her mind, she, wasn't, she was nothing. She was like, why are you even talking to me? How are you going to ask me for a drink? And the scripture goes on that Jesus begins to testify to her, talking about the living water, which was him. Telling her that if you would drink of the living water, you'd never be thirsty again. He was sitting there. He was witnessing to a sinner. He was ministering to her. And the next group of verses that come, there are two different interpretations in my mind. And the first of these is one that we've all heard a whole bunch. And I'm going to read it, John 4 and 16. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. Now we've heard that Jesus is telling her, go bring your husband. She's like, I don't have a husband. He goes, that's right, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one you're living now, he's not even your husband. We've heard it that Jesus called her out on her lifestyle. We've heard it said that basically Jesus called her a prostitute. That he pointed out her sin, her lifestyle, what she's living. But if that was the case, why did she respond this way in verse 29? When she went out to the people, she said, come see a man which told me all the things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? And I was thinking about this. And can I submit to you that the Jesus we know, who we read in John 3.16, did not come to condemn the, wor- condemn the world. Could it be that he spoke to her in love and not condemnation? Could it be that he said, call your husband? And she said, I don't have a husband. And this is my translation, but could it be that he said, you know, you've really been through it. You've been married five times. And the man that you're with now, he doesn't even love you enough to be your husband. He doesn't cherish you enough. And I'm sorry that you're having to deal with this. I'm sorry that you've been put in this situation. Could it be that God who is love, who wrapped himself in flesh, showed her how much she meant to him? Could it be that he showed somebody who was worth nothing? who was in a situation that nobody wanted to be a part of, that he sat down and he ministered to her and he said, I love you. Because in verse 29, we know that she went and said, look, you've got to come hear this man. He's already, he knows what situation I've been. He told me about the life that I'm living, yet he still is the Christ. He showed me the love. Of God, He was teaching in love. He was showing her the love of God. And that love made her want to tell everybody else about Jesus. She wanted to tell everybody about the Christ that she had experienced. God isn't here to punish you every time you mess up. But he wants to extend mercy to you. He wants to extend grace to you. And he wants to show his love to you today. Psalms 103 chapter 12 says, As far as the east is, From the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. There's no reason that anybody has to sit here with condemnation on their head today. Those that have come in struggling day after day with the things of life, feeling like you can never have victory from it, feeling like you can never get past it, the same things that you feel like you go back to, And when it happens and you do it, then you sit back and and you weep bitter tears and you say, God, why? And I don't understand it. And God, I tried and I failed and I messed up. And you come into church and you feel condemned and you come to the altar and, and you repent and you say, God, I'm sorry. And it feels like you go back and you do the same thing again and you struggle and you say, God, can you ever forgive me? It's a cycle that we've experienced. It's a cycle that's real. We get to a point where you say, God, I don't even know why you love me. And God, I don't blame you if you don't love me anymore. But this is the same type of people, the same situations, the same points in life that people struggle with and go through that God saw when he wrote and he he inspired to have wrote that God so loved the world. Didn't say that God so loved perfect people. And God didn't say that God so loved the victorious But God loves those that are messed up. And God loves those that are in trouble. And it says that he took your sin. 
And he removed it as far as the east is from the west. Whatever point in life you're in, whatever point in this earth physically, if you stop and you look to the east, well, that would be the west. And you look to the east, as far away as they can be from each other, that's how far he takes your sins and removes them. And guess what? When you turn around and you mess up again, and you repent truly of that, guess what God does with it again? He takes it as far again as the east is from the west. Matthew chapter 18, verse number 11 says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which has gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. And it's a picture that we think as a shepherd standing there, he has a hundred sheep, and he's taking care of them, and he's ministering to them, and, and they're relaxed because they're around him, and they're feeding, and, and everything's good, but as he does, I imagine several times a day he begins to count his sheep. And all of a sudden he realizes there's one short. And this is not what it says in Scripture. This is just how my mind sees this picture, sees this story. I believe if he's a true shepherd, he knows each one of those sheep by name. So I can see him starting his count over. and He begins, there's Joe, there's Jeff, there's Jerry, there's Sally. He begins to count them, calling them by name. Till he begins to, he gets to number 99 and he knows exactly which sheep is missing. It's not that he just knows a sheep is missing, but he knows exactly who it is. He knows exactly which one it is that isn't there. And the scripture doesn't say that he just starts calling for them, hey, where are you? Hoping they would hear his voice and, hey, come, come back. Come on, where are you? Hello. But the scripture says here that he goeth into the mountains. He goes on a journey. He goes up into the hills, actively searching and looking for the one sheep who he recognizes has gone astray. And when we drift, Jesus just doesn't say, hey, I'm right here. Come on, come back. Hey, I'm calling you. You should come see me. But he knows you by name. He knows exactly who you are and where you've gone. And actively he goes into the mountains looking, searching for you. And it says, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Don't get me wrong, he's excited and he's happy that the 99 are exactly where they should be. He's happy that they're still in the same place that he left them. But he's so full of love and so grateful that he can return the missing one back to join the other 99 in a place where they need to be. The musicians would come. One more story that I'd like to talk about. Story we all know again, and that is of the prodigal son. In this story, he received, he went to his dad and said, Dad, I want everything you have for me. His father split everything he had between the two sons, and he gave the one. He says, here you go. You want it, you can have it. He received his inheritance. He went out into the world. He partied. He wasted it all. He left it. And he left the place of love to go into the world. He left a place where he had his father's love. He left a place of security. He left a place where he, where he had everything that he needed. And he left to go and, and to do the things that he wanted to do. The Bible says that there came a famine into the land where he was. And he found somebody who was willing to, to let him feed the pigs. And there's, there's, there's hours and hours that could be te- taught and, and preached about in this story. And, and I'm not going to go there. But he was with the pigs. And he, it, it ends up saying he was eating the same thing the pigs were. He was in bad shape. He was living with them. He, he was, I, I, I would like to say that he 
was at a place where he never imagined he could get to. Living with his father, living in that security, living under those blessings, he never thought he would ever be in the situation that he ended up in. But the scripture says that he came to himself. And when he came to himself, he began to think about the servants in his father's house. He began to think about how good they had it. And we preach about, oh, that the servants even had it better than he did at that point. And and that's true. But I want to simply say that when he came to himself, he began to think about home. He began to think about a place of love. He began to think about the goodness that was there, the love of his father. He remembered the place where people cared for him. They knew who he was, the love that he had. And when he remembered those things, he began to come back. And when he was on his way back home, he wasn't looking for a position. He wasn't looking to be restored to sonship. He wasn't looking to to walk in and, and to get anything. All he wanted was to come home. All he wanted was to be loved again. He just wanted to get back home. And the scripture says that when he was on his way home, that the father saw him afar off. And what that tells me is that the father had been watching for him. That the Father had been looking for him. And Jesus is still looking for you today. We know in the parable of of the 99 sheep that he doesn't just stand back and say, hey, come see me. I miss you. But that he's actively searching and looking. And he's watching for you. And no matter where you are today, what you've done, what you're going through, what you're experiencing, if you'll just start to make your way back home. All you've got to do is make up in your mind and say, I'm done with how I'm living. This is a place I never thought I'd get to. And I don't want to be here anymore. I know where home is. I know where love is available. And I want to make my way back there. And if you begin to walk back home, the Father's watching for you today. All you have to do is take the steps back to the love of God. We're not perfect. You may still be a mess. You may have made so many mistakes, and that's okay. All you have to do is be ready to come back home. Shall we stand? We know that the son had been living and eating with the pigs. He was in a bad place. He was in bad shape. And I hadn't thought about a lot about this in the past, but he probably hadn't had a shower for quite a while. And he probably smelled pretty bad because I know pigs stink. And for an individual that had been living with them and eating the same thing that they do. He was walking back home, smelling terrible, looking terrible, feeling terrible. They had been going through a famine. He hadn't had any food. I guarantee you he had lost some weight. If he had been gone any, any length of time, he probably wouldn't even be recognizable to most of the people. If the servants had been the one that saved him, they probably hadn't even, wouldn't even know who he was. But when the father saw him, he knew exactly who that was walking down the road to come back home. And because the father loved him, it says the scripture that he fell on him and he kissed him. And the first thing that the prodigal son did was he confessed. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And I'm I'm no worthy to be called your son. He didn't come back with an attitude of entitlement. He didn't come back saying, oh, here I am. I'm home. But at the same time, he didn't even come back worried about what anybody else would say. He knew what a mess he was in. He knew how bad he looked and and how terrible, how messed up he was. He didn't care what the servants thought. He didn't even care what his brother thought. He could care less what anybody had an opinion of him. All he knew is that he needed to get back home. And he needed to get back to a place of love. And as soon as he got back to his father and his father wrapped his arms around him, he said, Father, I sinned. I messed up. He came back with a repentant heart. He came back with confession on his lips. And when he did that, 
His father cleaned him up. He gave him new clothes. He threw a party for him. And he restored unto him his identity as a son. When you come back home and you have a repentant heart, when you come and you say, all I know is I've messed up and I just need your love and I just want your love. When you do that, uh, there's a party that's waiting for you. There's an identity that you can have back because you are a child of the King. God sent me here this morning to remind somebody that He loves you, that He's here today with His arms wide open and ready to receive you. For God so loved you that He wrapped Himself in flesh. He came and He died not to condemn you today, but to save you. And the love of God is here in this place today. Scripture says, there is, thou, there is now for no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And they begin to sing, I invite you to come down to the altar. And you don't have to do it to come down burdened. You don't have to come down shamed. But you just come down with a repentant heart. Come down with confession that says, Lord, I messed up. But Lord, I'm here and ready to receive your love today because it's a simple message of love for God so loved the world for God so loved me for God so loved you that he came to save you you don't have to be lost you don't have to deal with shame you don't have to deal with with the, the hard the hard things of the world and, and to go through it consistently but God has prepared a way out and God has prepared a way of escape and through his love today, you can receive what God has for you. I invite us for the next few minutes just to embrace and receive and accept the love of God. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, what that is is the Spirit of God living inside of you. And God is ready to give that to you today. He's saying, if you will just repent, if you will confess, of the things that you've done. I'm ready to forgive you of those things. I'm ready to remove them from your life. And I'm ready to give you my love, to wrap you in arms of love. And he will give you the Holy Ghost today. I invite us all, if you're still in your seat, to raise your hands. Begin to allow God to touch you today. Every one of us here needs the love of God. Every one of us here is... is dependent on God's love and I pray that you would receive it from him today in Jesus name in Jesus name